Please help us, Lord, never to forget that we are not here just to have a good feeling or to experience a goosebump. We are here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're here for people who do not know Him. Amen? That's what the Christian life is all about. In a few moments, I'm going to be sharing just a brief word from one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. Some call him Habakkuk. Some call him Habakkuk. Whichever you call him, he's on page 1144. <laughs> We have had quite a week, have we not? And I tried to encourage the Wednesday night group not to be overly discouraged over the events of this past Tuesday. Don't let it depress you. We are, act, we are literally citizens of this nation, but we are also literally citizens of another nation. We must be like Abraham, looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. He said, I'm an alien here. I'm a stranger in a strange land. And somehow we have to keep that in the back of our minds, that no matter what happens on the political scene, we are still born again men and women, children of God. And that we belong to another order. <coughs> Honey, would you say amen? <laughs> Thank you. The uh, response to my MSNBC. news event. How many of you ever went to, to that network, MSNBC News, on your computer? Did you find, did, I went there, someone uh, emailed me, I believe it was Sister Carnes who emailed me the actual website, and uh, MSNBC does give credit to at least 1,600 pastors who on Pulpit Freedom Day shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, but more than that, they spoke of the election that was coming up and that there's no such thing as a political subject. Everything that our politicians discuss is biblical. If it is a moral subject, it is a biblical subject. If it's an economic subject, it's biblical. Hello. Amen. And so those 1,600 pastors, including myself, took advantage of that Sunday and we preached. And of those 1,600, three were picked up by MSNBC and I was one of those three. And they, uh, they quote the MSNBC people under our pictures give a, a brief quote and tell you where to find that quote in the uh, in the message, evidently he's trying to find that there. I received an email. I, I counted them. I think I received 21 emails, all nasty. Uh, I've kept them. They're on my desk. I I will not let everyone read them because uh, just of the nature of the, and the tone. Amen. There it is. <laughs> this is what was on the uh, MSNBC website. And you can click on that arrow and you'll hear that message all over again. Huh? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, there is a quote, however, underneath it, the... Uh, yeah, here's your choice, a Mormon or a Muslim. 
And ladies and gentlemen, that little quote right there stirred hell. I'm telling you. Uh, I haven't heard language like that since I left the Army. Uh, a phone call. One, uh, one of the emailers said, as a concerned citizen, they are sending my sermon to the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, that, that really doesn't disturb me because all 1,600 pastors did that. Of course, we cited the 1954 act of, of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson and, and the whole thing. Of all the letters that I received, I want to read one to you. This is the only good one that we got. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. And it happened to be from a lady right here in Midland who picked up on this particular message. Dear Pastor Ken, greetings of love and peace in the most precious name of Jesus. I was ecstatic when I saw your name while reading the news on the internet. Just want to let you know how much I admire you for standing up about the November 6th election. I wish my pastor would be bold enough to address the issues to the congregation and not be afraid. You as a shepherd are commanded by the Lord to lead his sheep. And I know a lot of Christians are uninformed about the current president, and you are right. He is a Muslim. I thank God for you and for all those pastors who boldly speak the truth. Who cares if churches lose their tax-exempt status? The most important thing is to stand for the Lord and not be intimidated to raise His banner. Sad to say, too many pastors become career pastors. I thank God that He is in control of this election and will let the world know who He is. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you more as you serve Him with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. May His wisdom always be with you as you speak to your congregation with love and compassion in Christ. Faith. And that's not the faith you know. I'm keeping that one. Um, we're living in some very strange times, if you haven't picked up on that yet. Just in the last month, right here in the state of Texas, two pastors have been murdered. One was shot to death. The other was beat to death in his own church. Have you read that? Yeah. It's uh, but we cannot be intimidated by threats of any kind. That's right. The truth is more important than our safety. Uh, I thank God for the security that we have here at this church. Uh, if you don't know we do, we do. If you don't know, that's good. Because they are walking among you. But I, uh, I thank God. A few, uh, a few years ago, a gentleman walked through the church uh, into the back doors who had previously threatened one local pastor with a gun and uh, came, in, came into my office one day when I was here alone and we just missed fist, fist to cuffs by a breath uh, as he began to yell and scream and rant at me. And the uh, only thing I knew to do was just stand up. You know? So we were out here in the foyer, face to face, nose to nose, 
and uh, I was just waiting. But he finally walked out. Well, a few weeks later, he walked. I, I had told some of the security guys here about it, about the incident, and he walked in the back doors. And as soon as I saw him, I looked at all three of the men, uh, especially two of them, and I just nodded my head. And they caught my eye and nodded back. They, they knew what that meant. Uh, be alert. So we are living in some very, very treacherous times. Had you listened to one of the phone calls or even read some of the emails, you have, you have no doubt in your mind that given an opportunity, they would, they would take me to task physically. But that's the world we live in. Those who preach tolerance the most are the most intolerant. That's right. That's true. I was going to say quite a bit more, but I have I think I have decided just to, to go on and uh, let that dead dog lie. Uh, I'm not changing my mind and perhaps God will change theirs at a later time at a later time. But uh, for now we're going on. The book of Habakkuk has two very famous passages of Scripture. When I say passages, I mean verses. And they are both taken out of context. Isn't that some, we, we Christians, if it, if it makes us feel good, we'll just grab a verse and start applying it, not even knowing what it means. It just feels good. And there are two verses in Habakkuk that uh, are just like that. And I've heard sermons, messages preached on both of these. But as you, as you read carefully, uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word used in theology. Don't, don't take, take me to task over it. When you read the scripture critically, that means you try to understand it. You, you dissect it and, and devour it. It's not being critical in a negative way, but it's reading critically for understanding. When you read the book of Habakkuk critically, you, you see that these two passages of Scripture, these two verses, uh, mean nothing as to what people believe in. And so I want to deal with that specifically because the book of Habakkuk speaks to the situation that we are in right here in the United States of America. Habakkuk was a prophet, a minor prophet, who ministered to the tribe of Judah. It was prior to uh, the Babylonian uh, incarceration, we'll, we'll, we'll call it that. Huh? Captivity. Captivity. Let's... Uh, just follow along. I'm going to read through this and just give some highlights until we get to the passages that uh, are very important. In the book, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk asks a question, God answers. Then Habakkuk responds and asks another question, which God answers. So it is a book of questions and answers and response on both God's part and on Habakkuk's part as they, as they dialogue about the situation that Judah found itself in. Verse 1, the burden of Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Now when you stop to think about it, that is an incredible statement or a question that Habakkuk asked, how long, O God? Is there anybody in the house who has asked God how much longer? Yes, sir. When are you going to do something? Now you have to understand that, that Judah, though uh, it, it means praise, was in just as much sin and idolatry as the other tribes. Of course, Judah was one of the two southern tribes. But uh, 
They were, they were in great sin. They, they were in great violation to the commandments and to the words of God. And God had, can I recognize it? God had had a belly full. And it was time for him to take some action and deal with Judah and the southern kingdom in a judgmental way. And now obviously Habakkuk, a man of God, had been praying for a long time, lest he would not ask, How long, O Lord, am I going to be begging you? How long shall I cry? I've been doing this for fill in the blank. And you have not heard me. You have not inclined your ear to me. Look, there's violence in the land. There's no justice in our court system. Verse 3. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me? And there are that raise up strife and contention. Every type of sin known to man was occurring in the tribe of Judah. Habakkuk, this prophet, begged God, prayed to God for help. Therefore the law is slacked. He's talking about the people. They're not paying attention to the law. The, uh, the court system is, is no longer uh, abiding by the commandments of God. Those commandments given to us through Moses. Judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgments proceedeth. As we read through here, you can just see him talking in today's pulpit. Everything he deals with is what we're dealing with today. Behold, verse 5, ye among the heathen. This is God's answer. Advocate's question, how long are we going to have to deal with this? When, when is something going to happen? And he answers, God does, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told. There's the first verse that is so often taken out of context. And we try to encourage one another with those words. God's going to do a work, he says, that you won't even believe it when I do it. Even in the midst of all this sin and degradation, God is going to work it out. That's good news, but it's false news. Let me tell you why. He goes on, God goes on with his answer. You're not going to believe this, he said in verse 5. Even if we're told you, you wouldn't believe this. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. I.e., a.k.a. Babylonians. This is a prophecy just prior to the Babylonian captivity. Lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. Man, I'm encouraged. <laughs> God speaking to Habakkuk, trying to answer the question, how long, Lord? Well, you Habakkuk, you ain't going to believe this. But I'm going to bring the Chaldeans. And then he gives the most vivid description 
of those people. They were violent, vicious, flesh eaters. They were the greatest army of that day. They were feared by every nation. They shall come all for violence. Verse 9. Their faces shall sup up. Now I meant to get a new translation up here, but what have you got? Their faces are set like the east wind. No, that's still too nice. Too nice. Too nice. They shall gather the captivity as the sand. He's speaking about Judah. He's going to get, they're going to gather them up. And they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his God. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord? You gotta picture this in your mind. God's talking to Habakkuk. He's listening. I'm gonna break these guys down. They're vicious. They're man eaters. They're gonna fly in like eagles. They're gonna pick you up like the sands of the sea. They're gonna take you into captivity. And Habakkuk is listening with uh, whatever it is, bated breath. He's just paying attention there. And, and you, can, you can almost feel Habakkuk. The first time he comes up, How long, O oh Lord? And, and now, aren't you the God? Yeah, that's right. From everlasting to everlasting. O oh Lord, my God. My Holy One, aren't you from everlasting? We shall not die. Now there is a great proclamation. <coughs> Even when Habakkuk knew that this, this Babylonian nation is going to come in and sweep the southern kingdom off its feet, take him into captivity for 70 years, still Habakkuk remembered the promise and he said, we shall not die. Why? Because God had made a covenant with him. He will discipline them. He will chastise them. But He will not destroy them. The nation. There will be many of the nation that die. But the nation itself will survive. We shall not die. It's kind of like. I, and I get this picture. Lord we shall not die. Remember we got this covenant. Amen. O oh Lord, Thou hast ordained them, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, Thou hast ordained them for judgment. Almighty oh God, Thou hast established them for correction. Are you getting a new handle on this? God, you have established this, this vicious army for judgment and for corrective purposes for your people. God doesn't judge us because He hates us. He judges because He loves us. And he's trying to bring us back into alignment with his will and purpose. Yeah. Can you see our nation in this position right now? Now, I've got, I've got some things I'd like to say, but I'm not going to do them right now. I think that my time is, to, is better or more wisely used to go on and, and preach the gospel. But... 
There are those who are despondent over the Tuesday election. But I hear God saying, I'm sending this for judgment and correction. If my people who are called by my name, remember that passage? Will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Hello? God will use whatever means available to Him to, pe to bring His people back on track. I believe that this nation was established by God and for God. And He's trying and He has tried for years now to bring us back on track. I will say this about the next four years. You will think they will never end. These are going to be the longest four years of your adult life. Brother Robert and I, and perhaps even some of you now know, Wednesday morning, the day after the election, the first act of that newly elected president, we know what it was. I'm not going to tell you. What? It's your beloved constitutional rights one day after the election has been assaulted. You think the past four years was bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. But is God in charge? Absolutely. Tuesday did not take him by surprise. When he cast his ballot, he knew the end result. And the church of Jesus Christ had better wake up. Hello? Submit to the discipline. Submit to the correction. Habakkuk, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. It, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring judgment and correction to Israel. And I believe God is saying to America, you do not believe what happened Tuesday, but I'm bringing judgment and correction to this nation. Verse 13, there's a response. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? <coughs> this gets real good here in a second. <coughs> and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. And make us men as the fishes of the sea and the creeping things that have no ruler over them. That's a question. They take up all of them with an angle. They catch them in their net, gather them in their drag. They're, therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice, uh, sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag. Because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? There's another question asked by Heaven.
Habakkuk is intrigued by this dialogue he's having with Yahweh. He got the answer to his first question, how long, O Lord? He asked this second question, and Habakkuk says, I will wait. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Whoa. Now there is an attitude of a little steamy prophet right there. Okay, he answered my first question. He's going to answer my second one. And I know what he's going to say, but I'm going to stand my, stand my ground, stand my watch, and I'm going to have a good answer for him. And the Lord answered me and said, Habakkuk, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For this vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come and it will tarry no longer. Of course, uh, this is sort of a parenthetical verse that I haven't planned to deal with. Write the vision and make it plain so that when people read it, they can run with it. Well, he's talking about Babylonians coming down to destroy Judah. Right? Write this. Write this. Write this down. Uh, have a good. Make it plain. Make sure people understand that. Verse 4, Behold his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And there is the second passage that so many people just, just use it wherever they feel it fits. Well, now I understand that because it's true. The just shall live. We all shall live by faith. But look at the context. Even, now listen, here's the context. Even in the midst of the destruction and the carrying off of a wicked southern kingdom of God, there was within Judah and the southern kingdom a remnant of righteous people. Not every individual in the southern kingdom was wicked and evil and did violence and ignored the, the, the law and the commandments of God. There were people who loved him and sought him and kept his word and his statutes. They are the faithful ones. They shall live by faith. Faith. The act of believing. Faithfulness. The act of acting out what you believe. Tell them this. I know who they are. I know that they are righteous people. And Habakkuk said, how can you do this and give all this to the wicked people and do that to the righteous? How, how does that work? In God's encouragement, you tell them, Habakkuk, be faithful. Don't succumb to the pressure of the moment. The just, the righteous, will live by faith. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming into that time. And may I say for the umpteenth of time, just because a person goes to church doesn't make them a Christian or make them a part of the family of God. There is a remnant, there is a church within the church, and I'm saying to that church within the church, you walk by faith no matter what you see happening out of here. You do not succumb to the moment, you do not bend to the pressure, and you do not succumb to the fear that's going to come to you. You let that faith that's in you rise up and you walk accordingly. Yes. Don't just have a faith, but be faithful to that faith. I'm probably not making any sense. Yea, yeah. also because he transgresseth transgresseth my vine, my wine. He is a proud man, neither keepeth at home. The large of his desire is hell. Boy, I could preach a while on that one. <clears throat> and is as death and cannot be satisfied. But gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these taking up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long? And to him that, that ladeth himself with thick clay, shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and, and awake that shall vex thee? Thou shalt be for booties unto them. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul, for the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall Answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in their very fire and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity? For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Man, have you heard that taken out of context? Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink and and puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken, also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy uh, foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and the shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which um, made them afraid because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land of the city, and of all that dwell therein, what profiteth the graven image what, uh, that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make of the dumb idols. Woe unto him that saith to the, to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone, Arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it, but the Lord is in his holy temple that all the earth keeps silence before him. And you can just, just say, Oh, I'm feeling better all the time. Have a good thing to himself. Things go from bad to worse. He starts talking about the idol makers, those that set up wood and stone, various other objects and begin to worship them instead of worshiping their God. That's what's going to happen while they're in captivity, but there's a remnant. I just blew by you there. I just, I, some of you, I just blew by you. That will happen. There will be parts of the church that will bend and bow. And they will look more like the world than they do the church. But there is a remnant. 
There is a people that God will preserve that will not bend and will not bow. That sounds like it would make a good song. <laughs> and then Habakkuk closes his prophetic word with a prayer. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Now there's an understatement. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath remember mercy. Lord, I accept that you are who you say you are, and I worship you as the Yahweh of Israel. I accept the fact that your judgment has come. It is for correction to your people. But please, Lord, do this one thing. In your wrath, remember mercy. God came from time, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth, was full of His praise, and His brightness was as the light. He had thorns coming out of His hand. There was the hiding of His power. Before Him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at His feet. He stood, measured the earth. He held and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow, his ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride above thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word. Think about it, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. See, he's just, he's rehearsing in his mind who this God is that has made everything that is. He made the mountains. He, with his fingers, carved out, in, in poetic terms, carved out the valleys. He made places low for the rivers to run. This is the God that Habakkuk is now bowing to who was just a few moments indignant at what God was saying. Now he's saying, oh God, you are who you say you are. And I remember that you are the creator of all. In the end, ladies and gentlemen, God will get his glory. As disheartened as we may be today, in the end, God will get his glory. I still have a lot of prayer to go there, but I want to leave it. I believe that we can learn a lot about what God is doing in this 21st century by reading about what God did 600 years before the coming of the sea. Father, I pray today that your word will become a light to our feet, a lamp to our pathway. In the midst of the turmoil of our nation, may we remember as Habakkuk did who you are yeah. and that you are still in control. Lord, we say as one voice, in your judgment, remember mercy. Cause your remnant to stand strong. Cause your church to be vibrant 
and full of your glory.